Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com. Hey, Rob Stenziger <laughs> of Interactive-Storyteller.com. Yeah. So good to, it's good to be chatting with you. Yeah. Good to see you too. Heck, we're 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 recording a video episode. It's a video film show. That's right. Mm -hmm. Every other episode of the Lean Into Art Cast will be a video show where we will hopefully bring some uh, things that are worth looking at while we talk about them. Uh, do we have anything at the top? Do we want to front end this with any stuff that's been going on, or do we want to just dive into this part two of the design series? I hmm. defer to you. This this to me, Rob, is kind of like. I'm I'm learning from you. I'm looking at you. I'm saying, Rob, please instruct me on this. I let you dis uh, decide the pace. The, your pedagogy is the word of the day here. Wow. Ah. Well, let's see. Ironically, my pedagogy is to pull pedagogy out of the people around me. So that is, uh, yeah. I have the uh, absorbent kind of kung fu. So. <laughs> So it's much more like uh, therapy, where it's like, what do you think? Right? Exactly. <laughs> That's a very interesting observation. Why do you think that? Uh, <clears throat> because, uh, what's yes? Answering every question with a question is all I was going to say. Nothing profound. Mm, well, yeah, there you go. That is, uh, now, now you've, you, you have uh, taken my secrets out of my chock-full purse and dumped it right out on the table. Well, that's also good pedagogy. Yep. Is to show that I learned it from the Breakfast bread. Club. <laughs> <laughs> and smashing the cereal between two pieces of bread. Um, yep. No, but you know that is that is part of it is that you you don't want it to be well. Sometimes you want it to be a magic trick. It's fun when it can be a magic trick. Sometimes, as long as you don't lord it over them. That's true. Well, I honestly, with magic tricks, I think that uh, uh, for most audiences, you have a, a willful participant that uh is is giving you the benefit of the doubt saying you know magic uh uh magic is real so mm, let me still believe that and um you know let's see what you do yeah and it's like yeah and it's long as um i think i think the best magic tricks are the ones where, you, where the audience doesn't even know a trick's been played right where you the the the, the performer kind of dis I'm talking in terms of teaching now when the performer disappears from the equation altogether oh it's kind of yeah those are kind of like a double blind study where you don't know what's being tested you don't know the actual trick that's going on because there's another there's a pretense of a trick yeah that's totally baloney and uh, is, yeah we're, we're kind of like uh, putting a, a, a what is it an epilogue on the end of last week's episode where we talked about like fun experiences and like yeah my favorite teaching right. experiences are where the kids aren't even sure they learned something but they had an amazing time doing it you know uh, and then and then when uh, there's been like one or two occasions where somebody actually says to me like i don't even know what we did today and i'm and, I, and that i could like turn to them and say well what i draw something on the board and i'm like you know which one looks more dynamic well that one how come because he's doing this well you just learned something in class you just exactly uh, show me show sand, me the, sand floor. the floor yep <laughs> jinx <laughs> <laughs> Even with a little bit of uh, latency, <clears throat> we still were able to do that. Okay. Yeah, nice. So nothing that you wanted to make any noise about this week? Nothing you wanted to point people at that you did? You did a Polytechnicast. We should point people at that more often. The oh, Zoo Polytechnicast. sure. Polytechnicast. Yeah, yep, yep. So I never recorded one today, so I'm forgetting the the one I posted recently. But uh, Oh, slag. Yeah. I'm forgetting it too. It's uh, no big deal. But that's, yeah, that's one of the podcasts that we put into the feed at Lean Into Art. Uh, as is uh, Thunder Punch Daily and uh, Fabulous Secrets, t you know, two that Jersey does. Um, I've got I've got notes for my upcoming episode. See, there's notes right there, which I won't show any further than that. So I am recording more. It's just it's a it's a time thing. It's a time thing. It's not an ideas thing. It's mm -hmm. a time thing. Um, but yes, people should go to leanintoart.com slash podcasts. I think that's where all the podcasts are kept. So if you like the show, if the show makes you happy, and you're like, I, I wish I could have more more Rob in my head. Uh, <laughs> did that sound bad? Uh, then uh, you should go there. Not inherently. <laughs> okay. But I got nothing. Right. I, I did some stuff, but it's on my blog. We'll talk about that later if we have time. Uh, so design. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, design. Uh, well, here you go. Um, you ready to get flipped? <laughs> um, I wanted to seriously uh, know what... You 
Okay, so part of this design, I'm going to step back before I flip you. Um, design. We want to do a design series. We feel it's very important. Why, why highlight this as a topic? It's kind of a, hey, no kidding, guys. We do this all the time. We make, we make art. We create stuff. Um, does it really need to be highlighted? And uh, honestly, for, for us and for this audience, I say probably not. But it's still good to even look at things that you know we assume we, we know and, and uh, we can possibly dig a little deeper and, and get more comfortable with it. But I would say it's not just for us. It's what we could all get practice in. I'm, and I'm assuming all of us, but you know what? If, if anyone in the audience uh, has, has ideas to uh, you know, shine a different light on this, by all means, share it. Uh, go to leanintoart.com and hit the contact form at the bottom of the page. Um, I think we all could be better advocates and, um, I guess, teachers of design, where we can sort of present why is it important. Because we deal with people who need to, uh, you know, benefit from it, both ourselves and our audiences, our readers, our customers. When we, um, when we do, visual communication for a living, right? How do we get them to? feel like they have more of a grasp on design and why would they want to care so this is part of why we why we're tackling this so i am wondering you jersey droves when you go about your day-to-day -day visual communication storytelling what have you uh what about it when you reflect on it like what what it, what affordances or concerns or aspects of design seem to stand out as like important or is it oh um a big one for me i mean see a lot of my day job uh is not just freelance illustration uh more and more it's it's turning to teaching but then also being an event organizer so i'm in the throes of, d of developing kids read comics right now uh, yearly mm -hmm. event I put on with a bunch of other people. <clears throat> Kidsreadcomics.org, by the way. Um, and in years past, I've been faced with going to a lot of meetings where there's upwards of eight, ten people who I have to communicate an idea to. And I can describe something to them. I can say, uh, like going back to last year's Kids Read Comics event, which you were at, Rob, right? Uh, where it, mm -hmm. it moved throughout the town. It, it, the event had several locations, so that it was at this library, it was at the clock tower, it was at all these different little spots throughout the town, and I had a real idea on how this was all going to work. I tried to describe it in words, and people couldn't quite wrap their brain around what I was saying, even though they were natives of the town. Even though these people lived in the town, I'd say, well, it starts here, it'll go down to that bakery over there, and it'll go to the clock tower, and it'll move back here by the virtue of scheduling the events at certain times. Huh? Uh -huh. I distilled those ideas down to an infographic. I made an actual, I took a map and I worked out, here's the clock ticking as things are moving, here's some arrows moving around, nice clear graphics, and then here's an alternate way to look at it. We can look at it as a, a linear timeline moving down a page. Here it is moving uh, horizontally across a page. I gave them four different ways to look at the same thing. The first time I presented this, everybody was like, I don't know, Jers, I, this sounds really far out. Then when I did the infographic with clear distillation of information through graphics, suddenly yep. I saw the whole room sold on my vision. They were all like, oh, oh, that's amazing. That's a great idea. So one of the things I'm learning real fast is that while I think I'm a decent talker, I think the more you can express visually in a meeting, uh, the better. And I'm not just talking about bullet points on a, on a PowerPoint. I'm talking about, like, distill an idea. Like, what do you mean, move through the town? What do you mean uh, that mm -hmm. some events appeal to this audience and some events appeal to that audience? Like, color coding things. I worked out a color coding system and a shape-based system where tri purple triangle means this, blue square means that. And there was, invite with that little quick introduction, now I can just use those colors and shapes to clearly indicate what kind of stuff is going to be happening where, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was all design, and that was that was a huge learning experience for me in learning how to execute this year's show so as not to spend too much time debating, but rather get to the heart of what we want to do uh, and to find really good ways to display that information so that everybody understands so we're not 
spending a lot of time on Q&A. So through designing communication that reached out to people to express a, a lot of complex aspects and nuances of, of that event, you were able to make them all um, focused participants in uh, contributing toward one shared experience, one shared idea. Yeah. I went from a room of people doubting me, and I don't mean in a bad way. I mean, they, they, were, they were just skeptical of the plan. Mm -hmm. And by putting it into an, info, an, an infographic that made them understand, I didn't have to be as persuasive with my voice because the graphics were there to deliver the idea. Um, and or reinforce. Or reinforce the yeah. ideas. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, let's see. So it, that's one thing about design that, that I think is, is incredibly powerful is that it's not uh it does to me it's not about um imposing some kind of uh external thing onto people it's finding a way to reach them with where they are and the forces and the, what they know already and, and uh so if you're in a room that is has has a lot of light you will have to design the communication so it has a lot of contrast so it speaks to everybody, right? So if you have mm -hmm. um, some really subtle uh, colors on a subtle background and you're trying to display a slide that, that is an infographic that's reaching out to everyone and you're sitting in a, in a daylight conference room, that you may have trouble with that design, even though you've, you've thought about some of the their cogn cognitive concerns where you're trying to highlight that uh, you, you, you've come up with a, a, a system of symbols that doesn't conflict with one another that helps reinforce some other ideas. Ah, cool. And you're bringing it up right now. Yeah, I was looking this is the, I was talking with you. This yeah. was one of the drafts of the... It's like uh, a magic trick, actually. Yeah, actually kind of was. So this was in February of last... Wow, this is a year ago I did this. So yeah. I plotted out, okay, here's our three locations. And, you know, I pull... I, let me zoom in on this a little bit. Um, so I just took... <laughs> took pictures of the areas. Here's our three locations where events are going to be happening. I defined what different kinds of events we wanted to have. So here's invested attendees, casual attendees, and discovery attendees. Define them really quick. This was the handout I gave them. And I did a PowerPoint to go along with this. And then I worked out a timeline. Like here's how the events would move according to the time of day. Right? And then I yep. did it in a different way where I broke it down in a traditional, you know, kind of itinerary. Like so. And then I broke it down this way, where it's like, okay, here's the three locations, and this is all side. Let me see. I can rotate this. There we go. Yep. That's oh, cool. Uh, so then, okay, here's the locations, and here's the stuff all happening at the different times of those locations. So I gave them a multitude of ways to approach this thing, and I gave them a much more graphical approach mm -hmm. versus linear text approach. What are you going to say? Well, I'm curious. Well, what what do you think of how you broke down and presented the information like which one of these visualizations um what was sort of the most what were they most hungry for it, it, it what seemed to make people go aha this was the one right here the page we're looking at with the uh the shape based visualization the shape and color based visualization um because mm -hmm. the big the big question was is that they couldn't figure out what kinds of events were happening at what locations at what times? <clears throat> because another mm -hmm. complication that we ran into, and I don't want to belabor this too much, it's just I had the example at the ready. Um, but the, the, big, the big complication was, is like, okay, so we're going to have full-on workshops, one of which you led for us, and that was at the library, right? So we had like big spaces for big room workshops where we could put 30 people in there for an hour to an hour and a half. But then mm -hmm. we wanted to have because it was taking place all through the downtown, we wanted there to be discovery events. So this is more of a spectacle. This isn't an hour-long workshop. This is something, somebody with a pad of paper on the street doing a quick draw-off, this thing called, we call the quick draw, where it's two people drawing on pads in an improvisational, whose line is it anyway kind of thing. Um, and then we wanted to have <clears throat> sort of kind of walk-in-and-out workshops, workshops where it's, you don't have to stay for the whole hour. You can just show up for 15 minutes if you want just hang around for a little bit, right? So we had three different cool. kinds of events happening at any given hour, and we were going to try to uh, get or orchestrate them so as to move the people through the town. Oh, you had fun here? The next thing's right over there. Go over there, and you'll see the next thing going on. So we're parading the people through the town, uh, navigating them to the different locations so they'll see all there is to see. 
that's a hard thing to describe in words, right? I mean, I just right. tried. But when I did this, where I showed that, and I, and I arranged the elements, like these purple boxes in the second tier, are designed to show that, okay, you're going to start up here at the 11 o'clock. Oh, let me get it. Uh, I'm going to get the drawing tool out so I can, whoa, what happened? Interesting. It just, uh, yeah, jumped to the different page. Um, let's see if I can get back down here. Okay. And it's not going to let me rotate it now if I... Oh, no, funny. We just oh, learned something about Adobe Connect. Yep, learn something new all the time. Well, we could look at this sideways a little bit because I need to draw for a second here. So yeah. I point out that, okay, we're going to get the people started here. They attend this, then they attend this, and then moving through these events, they're going to go through here to this and then back up to this. And that gets them to move through all three locations. And then some people may show up before that, or they might arrive here first. How do we deal with those people who arrive at the downtown Chelsea first? Well, then we do this, get them to move back up. And what if somebody arrives a little late in the day at the library? Well, we've got this one to get them to go back down here like this, right? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a lot of doing, designing this. And this was a draft. This wasn't the final. But th that was the hard thing to sell them on. And so by doing it as an infographic, now I can rotate it back again, um, and breaking it down for, you know, and anticipating a lot of different kinds of cognitive needs, right? So some people are going to go, huh, what, what do you mean teen workshop? Okay, well, here it is in a normal kind of linear form for those of you who need to see an itinerary, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and then people could just drill in with that simple view of time, even though the other one is, is another time-based visualization. And this one has um, pictures of the locations next to the time where it's happening. So it's mo much more linear in the sense of the, here's the hours ticking away, but here's the locations sounding off next to each of those hours. So that's all I'm saying is that was a big learning experience for me of design mm -hmm. being a huge key into winning or persuading an audience, getting them to understand your point of view, getting them to see where you're coming from, making meaning come across for something that is, as you put, and let me stop sharing this now. Um, oh, get out of here, share screen. As you put on your screen, uh, you know, express ideas in the ways that reach people in new ways, express and manage complex concerns. A long way of saying all that. Uh, no, it was a great example too. I, I think uh, that's one of the things that we can we can be uh, at a loss for in this conversation is is having something really tangible. So that I, I I think that was awesome to to bring up the 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 detailed example because it's a squishy topic. We're talking about well, why is communicating in in a way? I'm going to crassly over simplify this, right? Well, why is communicating better better, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, you know, it sounds kind of self evident. But it's it's pretty it's more nuanced when you want to think about um well, okay, let's let's maybe we'll end up d digging a little bit deeper into into your example, but uh um let's ask the question why do people have different ways of learning? You want me to answer that? Because I don't got an answer. I mean, there's a lot of different theories as to that, right? I mean, it has to well, do with their Well, but their we know it exists, though. I mean, so maybe oh, yeah. maybe we can't answer hit why, but but then we we can go, well, well, what? Well, what are these different ways of, of, of learning that we have observed? We've observed certain things being effective to address communication, and we can at least observe what. And once once in a while, we can, we can uh, indulge ourselves and, and ask why. Um, and so, there's other concerns as well. There's not just like learning styles. There's also what is the dynamic of the room? What is everybody's personal story? What happened to them that morning when they sat down to look at the thing that you're showing them, whether it's your comic, whether it's a film, whether it is a presentation? Um, are, they, are they distracted by something else going on in their lives and they just need it delivered simply and, and quickly, right? So I just got I just got a comment on one of my YouTube videos. Um, it was an instructional video that I put up a couple years ago. Uh, I think it was like, it was one of my Photoshop ones where it's like how to make blue lines in Photoshop. I think that was the one. <clears throat> and somebody put a comment, oh my God, so much talking at the beginning. Scr uh, scrub ahead to the two minute and something mark and then it gets interesting. Uh, and th th immediately I thought of, 
like there was there's an uh, an inclination to feel kind of like oh am i too wordy am i am i am i too talky did, did i do a bad job on that video but then like that was about like a quarter of a second the next second i thought man how many times have i wanted to know something right now because <laughs> when my sink broke and i'm trying to fix the darn sink and i'm looking up youtube videos on how to fix my darn sink and then there's 10 minutes at the front end of the guy going this is a wrench this is a washer this is a nut <laughs> i'm like just get to fix the sink <laughs> you know i gotta fix my thing now you, you don't know what, what what psychologically is going on with the person receiving the stuff too so that's another one where it's like maybe the, the quick easy or the quick and elegant infographic is the perfect thing for that person at that moment but then somebody might be in a more pensive mood and they want to dig they want to drill down they want to really get some rich content here and that infographic isn't going to be enough for them there's a lot of am i, am I getting where you wanted to go with saying i i think you are it's that there there are a lot of factors and the world is complex and how do you uh how do you get so you have a goal with your something's driving the need for you to make something and having uh concern toward design and what makes it better and how does it achieve that goal better what is better and figuring that out for your project and it's going to be both defined on your perspective and who you're trying to serve probably and and again it could be just the context of well what time of day are you presenting and that's going to change the kind of colors that might make sense to put on your slides or it could have to do with uh, having some really complex data, which we'll, you can run into a lot and think about what are different ways to present this to increase the overall comprehension. Because the, the reason you're expressing it is to get the idea across. And you know that pe there will be different styles that will address crossing that line of, of yes, every, you know, person A comprehends, person B comprehends because of the second slide, person C, etc. And that's what this part of design, like, well, why design and the importance of design? Well, you, um, I mean, I think you nailed it with, with that example in that one of the reasons is to communicate better and convince people. You want to bring them together to help, or maybe it's not about convincing. Maybe it's about getting everyone on the same page with the right question to then find the thing that they need to con convince each other about like you're doing a big the problem exactly uh, yeah. identifying the, the proper question to be addressing rather than kind of going coming at it from a t the elephant in the room right everybody's got their hand in the different part and they don't know what it is yeah, exactly and so what you can try to do is find a way to unify those perspectives and that's one of the huge helpful things about shared communication but i do think um we'll probably hit that in general because we're well we are a what we're here doing the lean into art podcast we're we're you know what we, we do we deal a lot with communication and storytelling and, and the visual expression of all, all that and and that's what we do quite a bit so we'll lean on those examples quite a bit yeah jersey yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just uh, no, no. I mean, you get no argument from me. I mean, anybody who who uh, is surprised to hear us say that is is probably new to the show. Uh, but I do okay. think that other design disciplines. So we mentioned uh, Charles and Ray Eames, yep. who they've they've done well a lot of different kinds of design. They are incredibly cross disciplined. Uh, uh, married couple from you know active in the field of design, various fields of design from what the 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 nineteen forties through the nineteen eighties, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and, and, and furniture, filmmaking, uh, toy design, you know, uh, art installations, uh, you name it, they did something with it. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it gets, uh, and they're an awesome example of, of how it can get rather cross-disciplined and they can uh, actually inform each other in, in meaningful ways. And I think a lot of uh, the aspects of design we want to uh, concern ourselves with to understand better to be better advocates of it would be um, well w if you're trying to represent design to someone that uh, maybe they are more familiar with uh, classic painting or maybe they're really into furniture uh, you can find ways to you can find common ground they will have they will have experienced the same kind of concerns that you will want the conversations to to build toward 
through other areas of design. It doesn't always just have to come from storytelling. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of one of the the best emails that I ever got when uh, we were doing the Art and Story podcast, Mark Mark Rudolph and Kevin Cross and I were doing that show. Um, we got an email from a costume designer who uh, works in mm. Hollywood uh, doing costume design. Emailed us and he said, "Oh my God, I love your show. I don't draw comics. I'm a costume designer, but everything you guys talk about applies to my field as well. And it's fun listening to you guys and just changing the word comics to costume design. And it's as if." You just made the show for me. And I, I thought, wow, we must be getting at it right if <laughs> somebody can make that connection. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, you got all these cards up on the screen. I'm curious what these are. Okay. Well, um, let's see. Let me get rid of the drawing here. And I, I do have some cards. Uh, some of them uh, are review from last last week, and, and uh, we had a chance to see them. Uh, we talked about the sort of some of the forces of design that – uh may be affecting you as is you're you're going about it and i think today we're going to we're going to bring it from those forces to then start talking about things you will face as an individual and what it would be like designing in a group and sort of maybe those forces change and we'll we'll, we'll explore that see where we land okay sounds fun sounds like sounds like a good park to walk through Cool. So heuristics, trial and error, Heur rules of thumb. Heuristics? Yeah. How do you pronounce it? Is it heuristics or heuristics? The <laughs> history or her story? Uh, good question. <laughs> I, I, I would say it's uh, it's whatever works for you. <laughs> heuristics. <laughs> I'm from Minnesota. We pronounce lots of things funny. So <laughs> I will go into um, wacky accent, don't you know, once in a while. And what what can you do? Um it's where I'm from. So we, we would say heuristics, I think. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm from Michigan, almost Minnesota, so I'll say heuristics too. Okay. So, yeah, here we have our, our rules of thumb, trial and error, critical thinking over time. This is one of the things that uh, I, th I think we should just kind of jump around with this. Like I, one of the best could be, and part of it, this is totally self-serving, is that uh, heuristics have helped me a lot in team situations. Interesting. How? Because uh, they're often, you can express it as a test and then have someone else detect if that design concern is present or not. So it becomes a rule of thumb. Uh, so I will, in, in the case of uh, like designing screens and working in a team in a software environment, and if I um, you know, design a set of screens and they have a certain layout and a certain you know, set of uh, positioning and grouping of elements and other style attributes like when you'd style a web page like font and font weight and what have you um, and if someone were developing and not as concerned about those design concerns then they may miss certain things and a rule of thumb can tell can help you notice if you're missing that or not because if you've if you've never really thought about um, it's a classic uh, software development dynamic I'm not I don't know. I can't. I wouldn't. I would assume I'm not offending anyone in saying that a lot of times when a designer puts out a screen, a strength and weakness that can happen there is maybe they're not thinking of the platform and thinking, well, you don't actually have this control in your toolbox, but hey, it looks cool and I made it up. Good luck, developer. And then the developer is like, you know, putting stuff together, making it all work, and then it works at the end of the day, but maybe it looks laid out a little bit not as tight right so how do you yeah so it's inter this these things can can you know work both ways as far as uh design concerns honestly it doesn't this just have to be the, the visual. world of, of print design as well i remember when i was working at the newspaper and we were dealing with uh was like a 133 line screen very low hmm. res stuff because it was being printed on newsprint and we'd get these kids who'd come in i was a kid too but i mean like there was always the new guy who was going to come in, he was going to shake up the world of, of newspaper coupon advertising design, and I'm going to use gradients, and it's going to have 12 different colors yeah. of purple on it, never mind that it's a spot color, and then the pressman would call us and say, hey, this ad is not, it's going to look like crap if you try to print it like this. you got to simplify mm -hmm. it. And so then you get into these rules of thumb of, yeah, gradients, probably not a good idea. You know, uh, if you're going to be printing on newsprint, uh, you know, yeah. if you're going to be doing a spot color, 
two different variations of shade of the spot color for a coupon clipping advertisement. You don't want to go beyond that. It's not a hard and fast rule. I'm sure somebody can break that rule and come up with something really unique and dynamic. But as a general rule, in order to keep the production moving smoothly and keep the press men from calling us up and screaming at us, uh, keep it simple, right? You know, because you've got to work with limitations of the technology. Yes, exactly. Uh, you're, you're addressing a constraint. And design often deals with constraints. Mm -hmm. And you can test these boundaries and see where you can stretch and change them and whatnot, but, uh, but, uh, and make a new version of your rule of thumb or maybe an exception or what have you. But having it in the first place, so for me, one of the, one of the common things is I would come up with uh, column layout guidelines. And it will help with the overall alignment and uh, readability of form-based user interfaces, right? Where that stuff can be easy to lose track of, and just having some simple column guidelines and how do you treat things? How do you how do you have a, a common har harmonious alignment? And especially if express if it's expressed in ways that that makes sense to um, a you know, a developer audience, where they're like, oh, okay, cool, I know how to set this alignment on that control and do to do. Um, it becomes a simple rule of thumb, easy to enforce, and then the final product because not every step passed through my hands as a designer, it uh, still has the, uh, well, strong desire, you know, it, it has the desired effect. The, the end result looks like the intended result. Mm -hmm. And yeah, rules of thumb are kind of awesome for that. As, uh, and they can help, I mean, I would say they're, they're helpful individually because then you can give yourself shortcuts. Mm-hmm. So you can get up to speed quickly if you're like, oh, man, it's been a while since I've been on this project. And then look a few things up and say, oh, yeah, we were um, we, we based all of the size choices on uh, 2EM of Myriad. And it makes everything visually harmonious because we um, everything was was some multi, you know, multiplier of, of that like you could. Going You'd have a golden ratio that we talked about. Exactly. One, right? Like some, like a ratio that replicates itself tends to, we're going to group those images. We're going to group those things together in our mind. We're going to make sense and order out of that. Just like when you're looking at a cloud and you say Volkswagen or praying mantis, because our minds are conditioned to look for those patterns and make order out of what we, what looks on the surface to be chaos, right? Wait a minute. Volkswagen, do Volkswagens resemble a praying mantis? <laughs> Volkswagen, comma, praying mantis. Okay. No, I thought, oh my gosh, I never saw it before. <laughs> <laughs> I am missing out. Um, yeah, we talked about this last time, right? It's like, yeah, which yeah. one looks more man-made, right? Yes, exactly. And right now, I, I'm just sort of, uh, I'm so zoomed in, I'm not seeing my, my slides overall. Um, so, let's see. Yeah, we, we were going through those design forces, and uh, I think... You know, for the most part, we you know, so we covered heuristics in high detail, personal opinion. Um, oh boy, gosh, each of these makes an interesting uh, point in the whole uh, individual versus uh, um, a group design situation, don't yeah. they? Yeah, because like, okay, group design decision would be if we go by heuristics and rules of thumb. Going back to my coupon clipper days mm -hmm. as an example, uh, if you have, want an ad that looks like it's a thirty percent off coupon, you probably want to put a dotted line border around the ad. Clip this out. You get 30% off your thing, right? That dotted line indicates, cut me out. Use me for something. I'm a functional mm -hmm. piece of this newspaper. It's um, a call to action in a way. Call to action. And, and most designers in our department would agree that that's an effective tool. It seems to work, and the clients seem to like it. Personal opinion would be, is that going to have a rounded corner or a square corner? Nobody's going to argue that it's a coupon, whether it has a rounded corner or a square corner. But we had people in there who were like, it must have a rounded corner. That's a smoother thing. It's easier to cut, and it, and it blends better with the other surrounding elements. Uh, no, you want to use the square one because square represents like more of a grid style, and it looks more like something that you cut straight clip, straight clip, straight clip. You know, That was the kind of arguments people got into in that department. But that's Sure, you're going to make people feel bad if they're not following that, cor that curve. <laughs> Be like... <laughs> Oh, look at this sloppy coupon. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. My safety scissors can't do those kind of jagged, uh, quick corners. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, that, that, that in a nutshell is the difference between operating from rules of thumb and then going to your personal opinion. 
um, I, I want to do the ad that has the, the blue spot color because I think that the cyan looks better with this particular arrangement of elements. It's a personal gut reaction. Is it objectively mm -hmm. better? Mm, that's hard to debate. Um, an example I like to think about uh, is uh, Filmation's cartoons of the 80s. If you look at, or 70s even, 70s and 80s, you look at those shows, the sky can be any color that the color director wanted it to be that day. The sky is not blue. It is not objectively blue. The sky is whatever color meets the mood of the scene. If it's a scary scene, the sky's going to be red, or it's going to be purple and black. If it's a happier scene, it's going to be either green or yellow, maybe blue, but it's going to be a brighter, happier color, happier in quotes, right? That is, an, that is a pretty co clever device. Like yeah. really efficient. Obviously, you can just put one big splotch of color out there and yeah. get a uh, sort of a general reaction from it. Oh man, look at the skies and all those those filmation cartoons. Man, I could just stare at their backgrounds for hours. They, they they had a guy, one guy in charge of their whole color department. That guy was a master, a mm. master. I mean, he, I put him in the same uh, grouping as like uh, whoever did the color keying for the Craig McCracken cartoons, Powerpuff Girls. You've seen mm. those, yes? Yes. Yeah, Powerpuff Girls the movie. Man, that movie, what they do with color is just, I, I'm still picking it apart. And I'm, I'm going to rewatch mm. it again before I dive into my new, new comics. I really want to kind of get under the hood of this color theory stuff. But again, that, that's something where, you know, that, that's, that, that's not a, an objective thing, right? That's not, a, we, but it's based on some heuristics, though, because like when I was talking about happy colors, warmer colors for like lighter moments of the story versus dark reds, blood reds, purples, and blacks for scarier moments of the story. That's a heuristic. That's a rule of thumb. It it is, and actually, uh, some of that is the, is cultural based. So a lot of it's based on sort of tr traditions and stories and whatnot that that cultures embrace that gives meaning to color because color doesn't inherently have meaning. Yeah, like that joke in Project Just, Echo. The you've seen Project Echo, yeah? I, I have not actually. I'm surprised. What? Yeah, it's, a, it's no. an anime. I know. Um, there's, it's there's an area joke. that I'm almost well versed in, but it, it's uh, not quite. Well, it's been it's been 20 years since I've seen it, but uh, it, if I as I remembered, it was a big send up to a lot of the popular animes of the time. Like it it <laughs> rib, it riffed on a whole bunch of different animes, and cool. in I believe it was an Akira send up they were doing within the story, and a guy's in this tunnel, and all of a sudden a scary form starts walking mm -hmm. towards him, and it's Colonel Sanders uh, from Kentucky Fried Chicken. And he's all in white, <laughs> right? Southern gentleman, all in white. And it's this terrifying moment of the story. And as a, when I was, you know, in my late teens, early 20s, I was like, uh, I guess I'd have to be in my late teens. Um, I didn't get the joke. I was like, what's those, I, I guess it's an absurdist thing. But no, I found out mm -hmm. later that white is a death motif in yep. Japan. It was referring to the fact that when Kentucky Fried Chicken came to Japan, here's this mascot. It'd be like if, if they, we imported some Japanese restaurant and the Grim Reaper was their mascot, mm -hmm. right? Come meet at, at, at uh, you know, Sickle, uh, Sickle's uh, Death Cutter <laughs> Hamburger Shack. Eat a Sickle Sandwich. There you go. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Didn't mean to go off on that. Um, no, it's, yeah. It, that's, yeah, culture. Uh, and there's subcultures. And it's not even, uh, because obviously the, with your death example, hey, you know what? That totally appeals to some some subcultures right and uh you know they get they get meaning playing off of that i've and obviously as a character i've always en uh, i've always enjoyed that ever actually ever since piers anthony's book uh uh on a pale horse so uh, anyway. yeah i saw uh -huh. your tweet today where you were talking about uh going gray and you were hoping that the hair stays long so you can go full on gandalf and i was like wow that's so cool <laughs> that might know a guy who like will actually look like Gandalf and he'll like be like my age, you know that that that, that would make growing old kind of cool because I can't do it. I, I don't I don't have <laughs> I don't have well, the stuff on top of my skill to do that. But you need to know a guy who actually looks like Gandalf. Um, yeah, you I'll are. I'll do my best. But uh, anyway, yeah. So, so... Yeah, we, we talked about fashion last time too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so where next? We want to talk about like uh, you know personal experiences versus designing with a group, right? Yeah, what's funny is uh, now I have all four of these sort of on the screen at the same time because uh, I think we can refer back to it and uh, and each of them we could talk about, well, what, what, um, what does this design force do in relation to when, when you have uh, uh, with, with you as an individual and then what, how does it affect 
when you're dealing with uh, a, a design at, as a as a team, right? So so you have a project that that's completely within your control and a project that isn't. And so what does that do? And I think there's other ways to look at it too. When when projects are completely within your control, you still may want to give up some control because you want to have it achieve a certain desired effect. Explain. So I th I look at it as are you are you building or doing the thing, or making something as a an act of expression, pure expression, or is it an act of service? And I think you can do an act of service where it, it you're, you're creating something that's meant to, um, well, maybe you're getting paid for that, right? And so you, you have other uh, roles and uh, perspectives to address yep. in bringing that about. Or you, you just decided, you know what, I want to make sure that this website is really, really fun for 8 to 12-year-olds. Yep. And you picked an audience, and it's your project, and you, you want to... Um, but by choosing to serve, that just that changes things up. Um, I didn't think about it that way, but yeah, when you do choose to serve, you are relinquishing a certain level of control, aren't you? You're submitting yourself to another, even if it's an imagined group, uh, their concerns, right? Yeah, you exactly. Say, you don't get to say, well... To heck with it, my kid's story is going to have the main character's head get blown off on page one. Right? To heck with it, my story is going to start with um, a, a gratuitous rape scene. <laughs> sure. Or almost any scene from Kill Bill. Yeah. One and two. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much all of it's out. <laughs> Whoa, you're right. Now that I think about it, yeah. Holy cow. Maybe you so, can have a conversation with uh, the the martial arts trainer, the the sword master, a couple of those, like a hi, how's it going kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, fifteen seconds. Fifteen seconds. A few seconds here and there. <laughs> well, Not that's many. Tarantino's his prerogative, right? He, he's he's got his style, he's got his voice, and he he knows he knows what his audience is. Like he does, he exactly. doesn't present Kill Bill as being like fun for the whole family. <laughs> no. And uh, you know, but maybe that helps uh, shape his concerns too, because I. Right. And you could actually find ways where they overlap. You could you could find out where your natural expression is very well met with a given audience to serve. Right. Which that would probably be a more efficient thing to design for you than that, something yeah. where it's and not again, well met. Co to concretize what you just said, um, you know, people ask me sometimes, like when I tell them, like whenever I team up with uh, another collaborator or take on a freelance job, I throw out this rule up front is that I don't draw anything over PG-13. I just don't. And they said, mm. they, the question is always put back to me, is like, is that a religious thing? Is that a moral thing? Like, no, no, it's just that that's where I'm comfortable. That's where yeah. I know I'll do my best work. And whenever I've tried to go outside of that realm and do something a little bit more edgy than PG-13, I always fail. I, I'm just bad at that. So I've learned over 17, whatever, however many years I've been doing this, to draw a line around that and say, this is the territory where I can feel at ease. Um, so sometimes, yeah, you, you will find a limitation works, jives well with who you are as a person, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's... Uh... Yeah, it, so you can you can avoid uh, avoid the the stress. I mean, sure, I, you know, you could try to try things that um, there's been a lot of I don't know uh, team management, business, pop psychology, philosophy that's all about uh, find your weakness and and, a, and deal with that. But you could just stick with what you like and enjoy too, and just <laughs> hang out with your strength and have a better time of it. Yeah, then I just defer back to the Star Trek Five where Kirk says, "I need my pain." <laughs> there you makes go us, makes us who we are <laughs> but okay so let's talk about okay so which you want to take on first you want to take on designing for yourself with these four forces and then go with working with a group yeah let's do it all right so um i could give you another example of how i'm facing um working as a service on a project i'm designing um I just got the contract for um, the second book of the Captain Seriously series. You remember awesome. that? Awesome! Congrats, man. Oh, yeah, nice. Captain Seriously. Yeah, you've uh, um, you had some good uh, um, Thunder Punch dailies that, that talked oh, about that. 
That's right. I did. I did cover that in Thunder Punch Daily. Uh, that other microcast thing that I do from time to time. Um, mm-hmm. But it was yeah. For those who haven't heard of it, it's uh, a, a comic book universe I created for a nonprofit organization called Seriously in Chelsea, Michigan, and it's it's a multi year project. Uh, I started year one with a coloring book. It was a coloring book comic for second graders, and every year I'm going to revisit a new story with these characters, and we're going to progressively age up the content to follow these kids along. These kids are getting their own personal superhero universe that I get to create for them. Wow. Um, yeah, it's 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 a bit of a dream job. I mean, I'm getting paid well. I'm getting paid like a really good page rate uh, to do what I love best for an age group that I like working for. So yeah, I get, anyway, um, but it's a service. I am working mm-hmm. with the public school board. I'm working with the principal, superintendent, great uh, uh, sec- or third and fourth grade teachers. There's a committee of teachers who are going to be reviewing the material that I'm creating for them. They are providing me with topics and ideas that they want the story to address you know and yeah. uh i was in a meeting three days ago and do i talk about magic tricks i was oh i get, I, I know that it's kind of silly for me to be proud of this moment but at the same time i don't mind being proud of this moment uh where they said like can you can you come up with a 12 page story that addresses courage and principles and uh uh what was the other point? There was like another subtopic about making good choices and working with your family. And without, like I had just enough time to draw a breath and then I threw a 12 second pitch for a story at them. And because they don't write, right? These aren't writers. Mm-hmm. They don't know what all the years of experience that went into me being able to do this. To them it was a magic trick. But <laughs> there, was, there was this instant turning of wheels where, you know, when I was putting this idea together to explore, okay, there would be two different convergent themes that are expressed one way through the bad guys, one way through the good guys, and it teaches kids this. Um, but I have to be able to say, well, you know what? My favorite thing to draw in the entire world is something blowing up and somebody flying through the air. Uh, I want a guy whose chest opens up and a chain gun comes out of it. Mm, not very appropriate for a, a third grade classroom. You know, uh, little boys think that's cool. Doesn't mean oh, it's yeah. good for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so it's like I, I can skirt the edges. You know, I, it's going to have a lot of action in it because I want I, I, I'm in service to those kids. I gotta write a story that's exciting for them. I'm also in service to the client who wants me to write something that has an educational and pro-social component to it. Uh, and then I'm in service to myself as an artist in the sense that I wanna create something that's artfully done as best I can within these restrictions so that it's not didactic, it's not preaching at kids and the characters aren't turning to the kids midway through the story saying, remember, fighting's bad. No, let them have the fun ride. The good choices will come through in the context of the narrative. The kids are smart enough to pick up on that, uh, but design it so that it's loud enough that the client will like it, right? So that, in a nutshell, is what I'm uh, an example of managing your design as a service, right? Make yep. it exciting enough. Uh, I designed a character for it named uh, Baron Mendacious, who is a... Uh, uh, an evil lizard man with orange lizard skin, and he wears this big fancy purple coat and he's sort of like uh errol flynn as a lizard man villain uh, and i originally had him with a giant pistol on his chest great big cartoony you know looney tune style pistol on his chest they mm-hmm. said ditch the gun no guns on, on this comic this is gonna be distributed in public schools okay well compromise can i have him have a fancy sword yes okay uh-huh. so again going back to rules of thumb probably not a good idea to have a guy who has missiles for teeth or you know uh, a giant gun in a holster or anything explosive or incendiary but you can have some uh, fantasy sword play you know you can do that he can have fire breath but he can't shoot a gun right yeah sure and, that's, and so that's, yeah, t- too near to possible reality right you have to make it a little bit more fantasized and that's that's going off of a rule of thumb personal opinion um there were people who are, disagreed with some of the, the, the character designs they came up with based on their own opinion. Um, the, the popular story, or the popular story, the, the, the story I've told the most is when I created the, the character who was a cat. Uh, but she was a lady. Dame Lady Cat. Yeah, Dame Lady Cat. And one of the people on the committee said kids can't or have a tough time identifying with talking animal characters. I don't know what informed that opinion, but, you know, that turned into a discussion. Um, uh, it's uh, yeah. What? It's it's, it's so funny. It, uh, everyone has different learning styles, different culture. So many different things can influence. Uh, uh, 
especially the the world of communication because you're looking at things that are uh, that you can do some science surrounding but a lot of the science is more of that that tested expertise that you end up forming here heuristics that you you can stand by it confidently and you can back it up possibly if you wanted to do some kind of double blind study you'd probably be able to prove some of the theories that you've got your heuristic based rules of thumb that you're following but at the same time you know what you're too busy getting stuff done <laughs> yeah yeah and, and, it's necessarily and, fun to study on it and, and to make to make sure that people understand that i'm not trying to tell stories out of school uh as it were uh it wasn't a fight it was more of a discussion it turned into a discussion where we said yeah well, no, and I didn't mean as far as that necessarily, but versus like uh, more physics-based measurements, like saying, well, okay, we're designing a chair, and maybe we're disagreeing a little bit about does the edge have a bevel on it or not, and how thick will the pad be, but we're, we're all in agreement that the welds on the chair need to, you know, um, be able to withstand such amount of torque, such amount of uh, pressure from these different angles or whatever, because we can do the math on it right where you're in an area that it's math might help you a little bit but it's not going to help you navigate these yeah. soft presentations and discussions right? right where all of a sudden you have this personal opinion conflict and you can't whip out an equation and go like well pff, cat equals awesome done yeah yeah <laughs> i mean I, I did pull out some examples of popular literature, right? The Mouse and the Motorcycle, mm. Charlotte's Web, uh, lots of anthropomorphized animal stories that I was able to go, well, wait a minute, these are taught in classrooms. Charlotte's Web is a second grade text, right? So, or third grade yep. text, maybe. Uh, but animal anyway. Farm, Stuart Little. Yep. Um, but then we can go into to, uh, design principles. Uh, you've got in here, you know, cost, visual uh, information, visual communication, architecture, usability, aesthetics. Um, mm-hmm. When it came to designing the characters, aiming it at a second grade audience, the designs had to be simple, clear, vibrant. I'm not going to do a Jim Lee drawing. I'm not going to do one of those spawn drawings that we looked at in the last design session, right? I'm going to keep the design of the characters fairly open, uh, open contoured, uh, you know, using sharp shapes for bad guys, round shapes for good guys, that kind of simple thinking. But also in the dialogue. Uh, in an early draft of the story, I had a character named Turnbuckle Tootweiler, who is this uh, the, my my zesty southerner character. It's my one of my go-to things. I love inserting a zesty southerner in all of my stories if I can, and uh, writing that southern dialect. Right, uh, instead of writing the word letter I referring to yourself, you write A H A. You know, or instead mm -hmm. of my M Y, it's M A H Ma. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote this dialogue, and the committee came back to me and said, you know, you're dealing with second graders, and they're just learning a lot of spelling. And if you throw in dialect, it's going to be weird and confusing. You know, maybe when you get to fifth grade, you can do something like this. But for now, he needs to speak in proper English because that's, you know, part of the, the overall the struggles we're facing as an environment in these classrooms. Totally understood. Totally understood. I was not going to fight that battle because mm -hmm. that's a design principle of the age group we're working with. We have to, you know, keep this consistent with what everything else that they're learning. Sure, it's a, sort of an educational reinforcement. It's part of their overall educational system, yeah. right? Totally. Um, so yeah, so I would be actually working against what they're trying to achieve in those classrooms by introducing that in there. And I think about the Spidey Super Stories from the Electric Company. Remember those? The comics they did oh, in the yeah. late seventies. Absolutely. Where it was, it was Spider-Man comics, but it was told in this sort of uh, early grade school language of Doctor Doom fighting the Silver Surfer, and there was a lot of rhyming in it. You know, uh, I'm Doctor Doom, like sugar and spice. I'm I'm sweet and nice for now. You know, he was still sinister, but he spoke in this very simple kind of sing-song language that was easy for first or second grader to pick up on. Even had Easy Reader, this, the Electric Company character Morgan Freeman, on the cover of every book. You know, this book is easy to read. <laughs> Uh, and then we get to fashion, right? It's like, so I'm also thinking about when I design this kind of stuff, what are kids interested in right now? Um, how can I bring some of those principles or those kinds of ideas and that kind of ethos to what I'm doing? Um, you know, if, when I look at what kids are watching on TV, Phineas and Ferb, or, uh, say Pokemon, kids are still really mm. into Pokemon. Uh, I'm going to look at what are the common themes and common shared 
qualities of aesthetics and design principles that are going on with these different things? What are the intangible qualities that are that are kind of coming through in between the lines with the characters? Uh, and how can I how can I come approach that and, and bring it up to what is currently in fashion for kids now, so they feel like this is modern and for them? If I approach this thing with a Wally Wood type of illustration style or a um, Will Eisner type of illustration style, they, they'll probably still like it, but it's gonna feel different to them, right? Because I'm working with an older style. This is daddy's comics. This isn't my comics, right? That is a thing, too. Uh, and depending on the audience, uh, it can also, it, it can be a, a little bit dissonant where it's, it, yeah, like it's not for them. It's it's from, it's fr from some other, it's for some kids that that could be enticing. Like, wow, this is, yeah. this is different. That's really cool. Um, I know, um, yeah, at certain ages for me, that would have been off-putting. I'm like, that's not kind of fluffy and goofy like Bugs Bunny. Right. Mm, I don't, I don't trust it. <laughs> a good example, a good example is, is that uh, again, from my own personal experience, when I was a kid who was raised on Silver Age DC, um, I didn't have a comic store in the town I grew up in. I was in a very rural community where literally there was the general store and the hardware store. That was it. All right, so you just went to Whoa. the little general corner store to get a loaf of bread and milk, but there wasn't like a big box store. There was no comic store, nothing, not even a spinner rack of comics. Um, and so my very Andy Griffith. Was, it was very Andy Griffith, very Andy Griffith. Uh, everybody mm -hmm. knew everybody else's business there. Um, parents come home with a big box of comics they got at a secondhand bookstore with the covers all ripped off, all from the 60s. Now, remember, this is 1982, 83, so these comics weren't that old yet, right? And it's like... We're only going back a couple decades. Think about it oh, now. Yeah. It's like that. Be like getting a box of Image comics from 1992 now. Sure, or a Nirvana CD. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Put it in perspective. Um, <laughs> so I mean, this box is full of Kurt Swan, Superman's Superman's uh, girlfriend Jimmy or Lois Lane, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, uh, mm. Supergirl, Casper the Friendly Ghost, Hot Stuff, Richie Rich, all these old Harvey comics, Magnus Robot Fighter. Um, and so for years, that's what I thought comics were. It was this very kind of like clean, friendly DC Comics, Harvey Comics approach to storytelling. Fifth grade, a friend of mine introduces me to Alpha Flight by John Byrne. Are you familiar with John Byrne's work? No. John Byrne was really big in the mid to late 80s and into the 90s, uh, but his stuff is... Compared to like Kurt Swan stuff, very edgy, very like a lot of ink lines, a lot of feathering, but like kind of like this weird bloopy feathering. And Alpha Flight itself was kind of like this dark, kind of a cultish superhero comic compared to any a lot of other stuff going on at the time. And uh, a friend of mine, he's like, "Oh, you should read this. I feel like comics." And I read it, and I was just, I was, uh, it was culture shock. I was like, "What is this scary thing? This isn't superheroes. Superheroes don't do this scary stuff. There's monsters with like an entire face made out of teeth in this. Superman doesn't fight guys like that, you know." Mm -hmm. um, so you can create, like you said, a dissonance by introducing them to something that is utterly unfamiliar to them, uh, not in con uh, accordance with what everything else they're consuming at the time. Now, I'm not trying to say that I'm trying to do bromidic work or trying to do uh, work that is. Uh, homogenized and over-processed. Pandering? Tr What's that? Pandering? Yeah. I, I, oh, man. That's, that's something I take very seriously. I, I do yeah. my very best to not talk down to my audience. But, um, but at the same time, when I'm doing a, a piece of work that's meant to appeal to the broadest possible audience of a certain demographic, and I'm doing it in service to somebody who's paying me well for it, I'm going to do my best to make sure that I have eliminated all possibility that it's going to be rejected by the audience, right? I'm going to do my level best to make sure that this appeals to the widest possible group of kids. So there's not going to be a kid in there who opens up that book and says, oh, I hate this. Um, and one way to ensure that is to look at the fashion of the time and, and play within those boundaries. And, and, and not just rip off wholesale. I didn't put Pikachu in there. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, but I thought Pikachu is pretty cool. Why is Pikachu cool? Well, because he's really brave and he's really tough. But he's also really cute. Okay. Dame Lady. Exactly. Exactly. Oh sure, yeah. You 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 borrowed from the same forces some some defining attributes, but then took it a different direction. Yep. And I like drawing cats. But um, anyway, uh, I that's think cool. that that story that tells the story of working for, in service for somebody on your own. Yeah. Any? any I think it does. Yeah. And it. Uh, I'm gonna bring in a a, a funky 
uh, philosophy word <clears throat> that I think unifies the topic in both both the directions because as individuals what we're creating I think is affected by this and when we are of course doing what we create as a service and uh, it's actually the name of an open source OS too Ubuntu um, and uh, we'll put this in the show notes and whatnot but it's the uh, the definition of it is I am what I am because of who we all are Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. What what language is that? It is, let's see. Uh the do 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 Oh wow. Is an African ethic or hemis hemis philosophy from the uh Bantu languages of southern Africa. Hmm. Yeah. Pretty know. awesome word. And it, I, because obviously, you know, we're all soaked in the, our cultures and whatnot that aren't just about us, and so that's going to shape what we create as individuals, even if it's a ser if it's to serve our expression on its own. It's not totally on its own. That's what I think that that the that concept of Ubuntu acknowledges, and also that. Um, and there's different ways that that uh, like we'll, we'll you know. The, our, our link will point to the uh, Wikipedia page that uh, that points out others others interpretation of that and uh, of course in service to others and when we're trying to when we're trying to make certain art with certain expression and it has a, a certain design it's built on the best of what we know and how to do it with the materials with the message and and the effect that we're trying to achieve and the goals and the medium and all the the the, the factors that affect what we're making it's this other thing that it's all this that's available is also affecting that yeah. and it's yeah this anyway. is why we'll never run out of material to talk about this stuff because it's very, very dense and layered. And anybody who says that this stuff isn't interesting is, uh, I envy them their happy life. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say that they may be um, the ones who say that and then they look at you like, hmm, you know, they're the ones that we want to then say, well, are you sure? I mean, that actually design is actually, it, it's pretty useful and you actually deal with it all the time. Think about the car you drove today and how it looks and how the seats are shaped and mm -hmm. what kind of accidents it's meant to um, both avoid and survive. So how does I mean, this, um, this experience that I just relayed, how does that change with these four forces when we talk about working or uh, not doing it in service, but doing it as a force of self-expression? The self-expression is really about, it, it doesn't have, what's funny is self-expression can be very intentional, and I also think it can be just very, very raw, incidental, driven by just your action because you felt like acting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, if it's, it's really serving yourself. Yeah. And... When you okay, so if, if your project uh, is more about your expression and how let's see, so how would it affect that project? Because of some of your interests already, in some ways it wouldn't affect that project because it's already the audience that you want to reach out to, for the most yeah. part. But then some of the other concerns would no longer be uh, sort of tests of validity of is this de is this design robust for its purpose. So you you would uh, probably set aside. I mean, so so things like uh, turnbuckle tur tootweilers, uh, spicy southerner accent, would probably be kept. So and does, uh, does that mean yeah. this area, the personal opinion area, becomes a little bit stronger in the overall mix? Uh, it becomes stronger uh, for yourself because it's a force no matter what. Like when you're dealing with um, uh, your a. a some group that you're trying to serve and individuals in that group, the personal opinion will drive many of your conversations <laughs> well, yeah. toward I, bringing I your project in, to completion. I just turned in seven different character designs for a new character we're introducing into the story. And all I had was a name and a function for the character. Now come up with seven mm -hmm. different looks so we can decide which character to do. One of the designs I did, I found myself saying, well, what, what, what would they want? And I did that, and I mm. crumpled it up. 
threw it away because I said all these designs should be based on what I want and yes try to be in service to them but I got to design something that I think is cool that I'm going to have fun drawing otherwise this job is going to be torture right so personal opinion came in strong even when in working in service to others right because that's why they hired me exactly that's one of the things obviously that we are uh, celebrating is is your voice and what you're bringing to the table to the project in addressing the design needs it's not just about the needs it's not just about the audience because th weird ideas like Ubuntu don't just affect you optionally they're going to affect you incidentally and you it, so you may as well embrace it and be intentional about it that's my flat-out bias yeah. um, because that way you're you're you have the chance to tap into it and make the most out of it you're realizing that oh yeah I'm here because they want my voice it may make them feel a little bit better because they somehow you read their mind and you express that in a character and now they get to see their mind externalized and but did they have all the same subtle experiences and concerns that, that you've tested over the years that would have driven your other designs that you dismissed to create this other design? Mm -hmm. And would it hold up as well? You know, so maybe sometimes it, that's the, it's the classic problem of the Homer. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you better tell everybody what you're talking about there. So the. Uh, the Homer is what you get when you do exactly what someone asks because they asked it. And it was, uh, it's, it was an awesome Simpsons episode. So the Simpsons cartoon where Homer Simpson meets his long-lost brother uh, who happens to be sort of a, like an auto industry, uh, muckety-muck, high up, whatnot. And uh, he's able to give his brother, Homer, long-lost brother, like carte blanche. Make whatever car you need. And Homer makes the most horrible, horrendous, crazy. And obviously not everyone would go, would go to this extreme. But people will sacrifice different concerns when they're just drowning in their own, uh, meeting their own needs through their own personal opinion. And not as experienced in dealing with uh, what you would deal with normally with your design concerns. So yeah, I mean Homer adds like it's a uh, What's funny is I think there must be a Jetsons episode that gets kind of similar because I remember they had like some weird either that or it was just an homage where they had the sort of the um, The mother-in-law bubble right mm. kind of thing and didn't the, didn't the Homer have that or was that where the kids were anyway? Uh, well, I got it right here. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There's a secondary bubble thing that must have yeah. been the kids zone or whatever one of my favorite jokes from that episode is when he's telling he's designing the dashboard and he's telling the engineers, there's never a horn <laughs> around when you need one, so we need a horn here, 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 and here. <laughs> oh, my. So, uh, yeah. He's yeah it's got a his... step to go in. It's got a, is that what, a lance or something built into the side? It's like a lance I coming might... out of the, the side mirror. There's a, yeah. there's a bowling trophy on the grill of the car. Yeah, yeah. which is like a Rolls-Royce ridiculously emphatic grill. Yeah. Ah, yes. So this, that's what you get. This is what happens. This is what happens when you follow instructions to the letter. And I have I have designed print advertisements that are the print advertisement version of this car. And I've been on projects where I, when I've been in a situation where um, I've lost the battle and I've built the Homer once in a while. Uh, <laughs> I do everything in my power as a storyteller and a communicator and as an intentional artist in this world to not end up in that position but I still do once in a while but uh, anyway it does happen it does happen sometimes when you're working in the service of others yep when people it, have very specific ideas about what they want um, and there's an interesting th uh, thing to highlight there, there's one thing that we missed I want to circle back to that mm -hmm. that you mentioned I think it's a f magic magic trick um, but when you get into, uh, let's see, personal opinion in the group and, oh gosh, in the highlight of the old opinion, old, old issue, I, I'm losing the, the current one I wanted to do. All right. Circle back. Magic trick. In the service of others, so we're, we're, we're circling back to service of, ser service of others and something that you mentioned, Jersey, about... bringing together different concerns. 
and how do you sort of uh, so you're addressing things like your rules of thumb you're addressing needs and and th and, and uh, sort of measures that that are expressed to say this is what will make the design successful like it has to fit into our educational system mm -hmm. it has to make you know, sort of relate to it in a positive way and reinforce things and whatnot and you actually mentioned a magic trick that was so subtle that I just want to emphasize heavily and it's the idea that you said that you you mentioned using yourself as one of the clients so you put yourself in this situation where in your list of people to make sure that they you get your buy-in and approval to get through phases and get you know um, to, to get successful delivery on different aspects of the project and different stages well along the way make sure you're one of them yeah and that way you don't lose track of it and you don't get lost in the whole um, other people's personal opinion I think I think what you're talking about though comes with um, it, there has to be a sense of self-awareness self-confidence and experience to inform that to and I think it's something where if you're new to this thing it's definitely worth reminding yourself of that because when you first start freelancing uh, you just want those jobs so bad that you don't want to argue with anybody right um, it's not the arguing it's the how because they right. they I would I would say that absolutely you're going to run into and here's oh you you you're awesome Jersey you brought me back to the other point too because they relate <laughs> it has to do with this shared outcome and honestly the word that we've avoided to this point is control and that's what happens when you're working um, when you work indiv individually and you're just serving your own um, needs and you're not worried about doing this as a service it's purely expression you have ramped the control knob all the way to you <laughs> mm -hmm. and when a client brings you in to help design something no matter what it is they have somehow turned down the control knob that that isn't no longer pointing just to them anymore and depending on the client they may they may want that to point back to them and just have you sign off on it <laughs> yeah or they may be okay with many gradations in between and I think without broaching the topic without participating in the conversation including your perspective you've dismissed your abilities and at least testing them at, like well even if it is your first contract I think it's plenty safe to do it I think the the uh, the risk comes in um, how you present it yes I've been present when a designer was arguing with uh, an advertising representative at one of the different advertising places I worked mm -hmm. when the designer said well you didn't you don't have a design degree I do Oops. Listen to me. Yep. That that conversation was over. Then the, then the ad rep got to say, I brought in the client. I'm the one who keeps this place functioning. You shut up and listen to me. Uh, and a completely different way to go about it is, I wonder what would happen if we tried this. And then, right? L let me just let me just tweak this. Let me see, let me see what happens if we do this. Oh, that's interesting. What do you think, ad guy? Do you like that? Right? A shared what if. Yep. yep completely different way of doing it that's that's, that's if, whether you're going to go on full on karate or if you're going to do uh judo or mm -hmm. uh, aikido right so but yeah, yeah yeah but um well cool i yeah i think that i think an important thing to remember is that you you brought this thing of control and uh even even in my personal projects even in the projects where um it is purely my self-expression. Like, let's take this front comic I'm working on. This is for mm -hmm. me. Right? I have no hopes that anybody's going to read this. A handful of people read the original story, and a few people trickle in every once in a while who discover it and say, this is neat. But it's by no means, you know, I've never had an article written about that comic. I've never gotten any awards or anything like that. Um, so I'm putting this comic out there just for the pure pleasure of doing the comic. It's purely self-indulgent experience. However, um, I do have an audience. I have an audience of one. That's me. And I got to think about how am I going to service that audience, right? Uh, 
and and this particular audience has very specific tastes that I took the trouble to sit down and address and write down. What is it about my favorite things that makes me go back to them again and again? Why do I cry every time I watch certain He-Man episodes? Mm. <laughs> oh man, I didn't mean to admit that publicly. <laughs> <laughs> but, Nothing um, wrong with that. I uh, yeah. But but yeah. So okay, you know, identifying that I'm my client. Um, and to a certain degree, I lose a little bit of control in service to myself, if that makes any sense, right? Anything I've ever done that I've ever been really pleased with, I've always relinquished a certain degree of control in service to either myself as an audience or an imagined audience, where I said, what would Anne like, right? Mm -hmm. What would make her laugh? Oh, I'll do that, and that'll help make, it'll lead to a cascading effect of, de of decision making that wouldn't be there before, so. And maybe that's an interesting thing in, in how we just not everyone feels that way as far as the relinquishing of control and their flexible relationship with the idea of control. Uh, and I think that will probably affect your designs quite a bit, both both individually and in service to others. And even if and where if you're doing it in service to yourself, that still is an interesting way to sort of um, get outside yourself. And it's it's not just a raw expression of this came out this way, therefore it is right. I feel like we got a whole um, another sub episode based on yeah. control in design. I think we're going we're gonna to be able to spend an easily an hour on that one. Yep. Oh, man. Um, especially when you talk to somebody who's fresh out of school and they have a a professor's sort of viewpoint impressed upon them mm. where in, in a grades basis, and I'm not slagging anybody who goes to design school or art school, by no means, but a lot of people will agree with me that your first year or two out of college, you're sort of unlearning a lot of stuff that you learned in college when you start doing it in, for real, so to speak. And it's like a forced integration of yeah. you were able to sort of do that in kind of a scientific, isolated experience, which that is wonderful to have been yeah. able to do that. What awesome to you know thing to focus on. But then, boy, is the world fuzzy and dirty when it comes yeah. to delivering that and somehow making it mean something, which is partial, partially the, the impetus, the reason why I want to try to take a swing at advocating design and, and understanding it more and and sharing that with this audience and and I want to talk more about control though because I've had situations yeah. where my my eagerness to relinquish control and to uh, in, in working with group environments where I've had that blow up in my face like really blow up in my face where it's like oh well we can all do this right guys you know, uh, and this is like like day job, like design work stuff. You yeah. know, I, when, when I was like working in a design, corporate design department on the 10th floor of a corporate building where the VP's office was right over there, that kind of environment. And sure. my kind of loose approach to management, as it were, I didn't have the title manager, but I was sort of, I was the lead designer, even though I was paid the same as everybody else. <laughs> don't you love that? That's always a fun one. Mm, You're the lead yes. designer. That means you got twice the responsibility, but you don't get paid any better. Um, but uh, where that loose approach, it, it really came back and bit me on the butt. So sometimes, you know, you do need to have more control and be that. Th there's always this balance of tension between, like, some people think you got to be that that pushing visionary pioneer who uh, drives everybody and everybody hates you, but you make a brilliant thing as a result of that. Or there's the Jim Henson approach where it's like, yeah, he you know he worked hard, but he also made sure to keep a spirit of play involved in there all the time. So there's a spectrum there that'll be fun to talk about. I think. Yeah, it's uh, I, I'm sold. Let, let's uh, let's dive into that one in another episode, um, and uh, it absolutely will relate back to this one because how your your relationship with the idea of control is going to. Um, affect how you go about these uh, the, the task of design and whether it's in service to yourself uh, as a, a pure form of expression or maybe we, we've got sort of this middle ground one too where it's it's a different kind of expression for yourself but it's it's really serving yourself as opposed to just being raw animal yourself right 
I don't know what yeah, to say. Maybe, maybe that's yeah. part of my problem. Yeah, I've never been to primal scream therapy. You know, I don't know what would happen if I did that. Yep. Get out the brush and some, you know, lay all sorts of paper around and get wild. I don't know. I don't know what would happen. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> uh, but um, and, and yeah, we got to dig a little bit further at this whole uh, business of working uh, design for yourself. But then also, we didn't really talk about designing in groups. So I think I think control is the place to go next and talk about sounds good designing with a group for a purpose, designing with a group for yourself, and get a little bit more at this designing for yourself stuff and how these four forces work on us. But uh, yeah, we're coming awesome. up on on my hard stop again. I apologize. And uh, myself as well. So cool. that's uh. Yeah, I think we, we took a good swing at it this time again, and uh, we'll continue. We'll, we'll press on. We'll, we'll keep calm and carry on and uh, talk more about design in the next video show. So um, Actually, I just want to admit, I'm already being primal. This whole thing, primal. <laughs> <laughs> Even when you're being primal, you're being kind of calm and, and measured. That, that that's that's Rob's problem. No, I, I I bet there's there's a way to incur the wrath of Rob. We just haven't found it yet. Yeah, you just have to put a guitar in my hand. <laughs> the way that's it comes out. That's 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 how it comes out. <clears throat> All right. Well, hey, you know what? Uh, a great way. If if you thought, dear listener, that this stuff was worth listening to, and we kind of you know tw plucked a few strings in your mind and made you go, huh, that's kind of neat. Uh, if you have, if, if Rob's diagram of these four forces uh, helps you uh, identify or organize your thoughts in your own personal design project, and when we say design, we mean just organizing anything into something to communicate, uh, you could give us a little pat the back back. You could thank us for our time and thought and, uh, and research and organization that we do to make this show by going to iTunes, giving us a star review. Uh, got a couple on there but you know we could always go for more it'd be really awesome if like everybody who listened to the show on one day like let's just say how about uh the day this episode airs so like the friday when we put this show on the air the moment you're listening to it go to itunes give us a star review then knock us up onto like one of those uh what is it called uh, the featured page one of the yeah the exactly notable lists that would be awesome That'd be super cool because then that'd be all the more people who are uh, availing themselves of this content, all the more people who could support us. And then that leads us to the next thing. So that was the free one. That's the free way you can support us. The, uh, if, if you really enjoy it and you're like, man, these guys deserve a tip. Uh, I, I, you know, I really got a lot out of what I've been uh, out of the last couple episodes of the show. Uh, you can go to leanintoart.com slash workshops. There's a whole bunch of workshops in there. Free, uh, not free, but uh, you know, hour-long videos of in-depth content. Uh, just browse through the whole catalog there. Rob put together this really cool interactive catalog that you can rifle through and do searches by keyword. Uh, some of these workshops, 25 bucks, Not a whole lot. You get a lot of content, and it helps support us making this show. It would be a great way to give us a kickback. You know, so the, the, as we said before, the sponsor of this, of this series of shows is leanintoart.com slash workshops. So that, that's the number one way you can help us out. So anything else, Rob? We'll be uh, coming back again with another episode of the uh, design series, and it may be the third and last. Yeah, thinking about yeah, design. Uh, I, I think we got a lot of mileage. Or on yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll, we'll see, see too. It's I, I'm into the whole. Uh, let we we can we can leave people hungry, or we could do design series one and two, or whatever too. So I'm flexible. I'm not. Uh, I lied. I'm not primal. I'm. Uh, you know what? <laughs> This is partially up to me, up to Jersey, and up to you in the audience. Uh, so That's we can keep this one rolling too, uh, because yeah, there, there's a, you know, we've got a lot of material to get through, and um, yeah, part of it is, uh, uh, yeah, it's deep, but I don't, I don't even think that we will fully, fully cover it all too. And I think um, it might be fun to actually, um, yeah, cover a few and then come back to it in six months or a year too. Yep, That's true. Okay. Well, then, uh, thanks to everybody for downloading and listening. We appreciate you giving us uh, some of your day. and uh, Indeed. You honor us, and we appreciate it. And uh, until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of Interactive-Storyteller.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. 
ओके बाय